Hi everyone and welcome to this new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we are working on a 2007 Audi A8 and its air suspension is stuck in the highest position and it won't lower anymore and I can tell you that's not a comfortable ride. We're also going to take a look at a Volvo XC60 which a colleague of mine and myself already diagnosed and it turned out to be something very interesting that I want to show you that has to do with fake parts. Anyway, let's start with the Audi and let's diagnose it together. Now, as you can see, the air suspension is stuck in a quite high position. For your perspective, when I put my fist in between the tire and the wheel arch, there is still a lot of room left. The customer told me that the vehicle did raise uh, for more ground clearance, but it never wanted to come back down again for a more comfortable ride because right now there's almost no suspension left. So it's a very uncomfortable ride. Now I have diagnosed quite a few uh, Audi air suspension faults in my career, but I think one being stuck in the highest position is a first for me. So I might really need your guys help and no, you're not getting paid for it again. Now you guys always tell me, Dan, the cars that come into your shop are so clean. Now let me show you that that isn't always the case. Let me take you from the stand and let me show you this. I don't know what it is. It looks like bird seed or something, but yeah, that isn't really clean, is it? I started the car and this is the menu where you can select the different air suspension modes. Now when we select the lift, normally the upper arrow will light up indicating that it's trying to raise the vehicle. Right now the vehicle is already in its highest position so the arrow is not lighting up. Now let's select comfort and you see that immediately it's trying to lower the vehicle but it doesn't. Now when we wait long enough. A warning light will appear on the dash telling us there's something wrong with the air suspension. Now after waiting for a while, after about two or three minutes of the car trying to lower itself, eventually this symbol popped up on the dash indicating there's something wrong with the air suspension. Right now, when I'm trying to select anything, the system is totally unresponsive. So after trying to lower itself, eventually the car gave up, set a fault code, shut the system down, so I guess that's customer complaint confirmed. Now before we continue diagnosing this Audi, I want to quickly share something with you guys. Now every once in a while you come across a tool that just puts a smile on your face and it isn't always the most expensive tool or the biggest tool, sometimes it's just something you've never seen before. Now about a month ago our shop hired a few extra technicians and we needed an extra battery tester. Now we purchased the Autel BT608E and first of all, it's a very good battery tester. Second of all, for a battery tester with a built-in printer, it isn't the most expensive one. But as a bonus, and this is the part I'm really excited about, it has got a built-in scan tool. And that's very convenient because when you're testing a battery and the battery is low, sometimes that low battery has set fault codes and this tool can actually help you clear those fault codes and it can even relearn batteries. And that's the part I'm really excited about. It's also very convenient and very mobile when you quickly need to read a code outside the shop or on location. Now it isn't a professional scan tool with bi-directional control. So for example, on this Audi, it will read the fault codes for the air suspension, but we won't be able to do uh, bi-directional controls. But if your shop is in need of a battery tester, a good one, and as a bonus, you want to build in extra scan tool, I would certainly consider this tool. So I guess that's customer complaint confirmed. The air suspension is not coming down and it's setting a warning light for the air suspension on the instrument cluster. So what's gonna be our next step? Exactly, we're gonna read the fault codes for the air suspension system. Now, we probably need to do some more testing and I'm bi-directionally going to try to force the air suspension down with the scan tool and all this takes some time and all the time the ignition needs to be switched on. So let me first quickly hook up a battery charger. We're in the car, I hooked up a scan tool. We're using the top down. Let's go to level control system and let's see 
what fault codes we've got stored. Let's read DTC. And we only got one fault code stored. It's the 01400 level control system upper limit exceeded. Now the fault code we've got stored, the 01400, is a very basic fault code and it isn't very helpful. It's just the control unit trying to tell us it's trying to lower the car, but it's not managing in a certain time period. Now the next step, I want to bidirectionally force the air suspension down using a scan tool. So we're going to take a look at the left front air suspension where there is a very big gap right now and we're going to bidirectionally uh, trying to lower it using our top down. Now let's go to actuation test. Please confirm ignition key on, engine off. Okay. Uh, it says function cancelled, marginal condition have not been met. Well, let's check. Well, the ignition is on. Now, well, let's turn it off and on again. And let's try again. Actuation test, and it gives me an error. Now let's try one more time using the top down. The ignition is on, as you can see. Let's start out by reading fault codes. And of course, we've got the same fault code stored. Now let's go to actuation test. Please confirm the ignition is on. It is on, and the engine is in stall state as well. The engine is not running for sure. Let's press OK. And again, it tells me function canceled, conditions have not been met. Not very helpful top down. So let me quickly hook up an auto and see if it can help us any further. Sorry about that. I quickly had to hook up my auto. I was trying to get the top down working off camera. I tried for 15 minutes, but I couldn't get it to do anything. Anyway, maybe I'm doing something wrong. I hooked up the auto and it worked right away. Vehicle is being lowered at front left end so let's press activate and let's see if we can get that uh, front left suspension to drop down so let's press activate and let's see if anything happens well as you can see nothing is happening at all when i was trying to lower the front left suspension it didn't come down but i did hear a click from a valve coming from this area so i don't know if the mic is going to pick it up but I'm gonna actuate it using the auto and we're gonna see if we can hear that click. So let's be really quiet. And we can definitely hear a click. And it's coming from this area. Now I quickly raised the vehicle and when we bidirectionally controlled the air suspension, we could definitely hear a click coming from this area. Now I know that behind this inner fender is the valve block that controls the raising and lowering of the air suspension. Now the strange thing is that somehow we can hear it click so the valves are opening, but there's no pressure being released from the air suspension. So what I wanna do next is remove the wheel and remove the inner fender, take a look at the valve block and see what's going on. Behind the front left wheel, behind the inner fender, we've got the valve block. Now the valve block controls the filling and deflation of all four air springs. Now the lines to the air springs are color coded and the red line is the one going to the left front air spring. When we were trying to bidirectionally control it, we could hear the valve click, but somehow it's not deflating the air spring. So let's take a closer look to see what's going on. Now, as you can see, there are six air lines going to the valve block. I think the brown one, this one is coming from the compressor and the upper four are going to each wheel. And I think the green one is going to a reservoir. Now the red one is going to the front left air suspension. So what I want to do next is release this fitting and see if we can manually deflate the left front air spring. So let's release that red fitting and see 
if we can release some of the pressure manually. Now, I think we only need to turn it a little bit and it should start leaking. And we can definitely hear air coming from the fitting. So let's quickly tighten it again. So we know the air is making it all the way up until the air block. Now what I'm going to do next, I'm going to bi-directionally control the valve again and see if I can physically feel it click. So let's activate it and it definitely clicks. I can feel it click, I can feel the valve move. So I suspect it's mechanically moving and we know it is working electrically because we can hear it click. So what's going on? So we can definitely hear the valve block click and I suspect, but at this point I can't be sure, but I suspect the valves inside are mechanically moving because it does feel like that. But again, at this point I can't be 100% sure. But I was wondering if we open that valve, where does the air from the air spring actually vent to? So I took a look at service data and it turns out that the air from the air spring actually has to go back to the compressor. So the compressor doesn't only supply the system with air, but it also takes care of releasing the pressure or venting it. So what I want to do next is release the brown line. So the brown air line that comes directly from the compressor, release it from the valve block and see if we then can bidirectionally control it and vent that air spring. So this is the brown air line. It's coming directly from the compressor unit. There's nothing in between. So I'm going to release that and take it from the valve block. There we go. And now I'm gonna use the scan tool to bidirectionally control the air suspension and trying to vent the air spring. Now, there we go. And bingo. <laughs> now the air springs are venting. With the brown line coming directly from the compressor released from the valve block, now we can actually deflate the air springs. And I'm pretty sure that if the vehicle was on the ground right now, it would come down. Now, because with that brown line released, the air spring is venting somehow, that brown line is blocked. Now that brown line goes directly to the compressor, which on this vehicle, I actually replaced a little bit over a year ago, I think, and it's located right here. So let's remove that inner fender and let's take a closer look at that brown line at that compressor. So I removed the inner fender and here we've got the air compressor that I actually replaced a little over a year ago. And here we can see the brown line going into the compressor. It then goes up into the wheel arch, goes all the way around and comes back out over there. And here we've got the brown line actually going to the valve block. So when the pressure is being released, it's going all the way through that line back to the compressor. Now how this actually works is that the brown line is directly connected to the valve block. When the compressor is running, it's actually supplying the system with air. But when the car needs to lower, there is actually an electronic valve over here, which is called the air return valve, which opens and allows the system to vent. Now, somehow this system is not opening. So what I'm suspecting right now, since the compressor is new, that this valve is not being controlled. So the connector for that valve is right over here. So in the next step, I wanna hook up a test light to that connector, bidirectionally command the car to lower and see if this valve is being controlled. So we're going to release that connector. There we go. And we're gonna hook up a test light to the control side of that valve. 
So when that valve is being commanded, a test light should light up. Now you can see that this is the connector that goes directly to the control valve. I hooked up the test light to the control side of that pressure release valve or air return valve, whatever you want to call it, on the compressor. Now, when I try to lower the car with the scan tool and our test light is not lighting up, then we probably have a problem with the wiring to that control valve and we need to diagnose a little bit further. When it does light up, that means that valve is being controlled, but somehow it's not opening and then we probably have a bad valve. Now let's control it and see what happens. And as you can see, our test light does light up, so we probably have a problem with our control valve. Now I wanna do some measurements on that valve to see why it's not working, but working in here is quite cramped and it's dark for you guys to see, and the whole compressor assembly is only being held down by three bolts, so I can probably take it out in 10 minutes. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take it out so we can have a better look at what's going on. So I remove the compressor from underneath the car and the first thing I want to check is the resistance of that pressure relief valve. Now it should be between 15 and 20 ohms. So let's see what we've got. And we have got 16.1 ohms. So that appears to be fine. Then the next step, I want to hook up a power probe and see if we manually can activate that valve. So I hooked up that pressure relief valve to the power probe and let's provide it with a power and ground and let's see if we can get some action from the valve. So providing it with a power, and it's doing nothing at all. So let's remove the valve and see if we can see anything wrong with it. We need to remove these two torque screws And there's not really much you can see. It does appear to have a little bit big O-ring. It almost looks too big, so I don't know if it wasn't sealing properly, but let's see if we can get it to work again. Now let's try to get some life back into that valve. There's not really much you can do. It is a sealed unit. And it's not going to do anything at all. Now it does appear <clears throat> that this O-ring is far too big. And I don't know, but maybe it wasn't sealing properly. And you can see a little bit of rust over here. So maybe it leaked and that made the valve fail. Now I decided to replace the entire compressor unit. I mean, the valve was already failing. It was a little over a year old. It's a warranty job. So I didn't want to take a chance. I replaced the entire unit with a brand new one. Now let's activate it. And immediately you can hear the car vent. And look at that. It is actually lowering. Now that looks like a fix to me. Now the Audi is fixed, it's sitting really nice right now. Now let's move on to the next project, which is this Volvo XC60, which was brought into my shop by a DIY enthusiast with a P0171, which is a lean coat. Now the owner of the car is actually a fan of the show, and I think that's also how he found me. He's a surgeon that as a hobby likes to work on his own car. And to be honest, he knows a little bit about cars because the things he was telling me actually made sense. He even bought his own scan tool and he was getting a check engine light and a PO171, which is a lean coat. Now he also told me that the fuel trims were way off and 
He told me that he already had replaced the PCV valve and he assured me that the diaphragm was ruptured. He also replaced the mass airflow sensor, but still the fuel trims were way off. Now my colleague and I actually started diagnosing the car together and fairly quickly we found an air leak. We were smoking the intake and there was smoke escaping on the back of the engine and there was a rubber seal on the back of the engine, this one, that was installed incorrectly at some point and it was leaking air. So we were thinking, well, that was easy. So we replaced the part, we fixed the seal and after that, the fuel trims got a little better but they were still way off. Now this is the fuel rail and inside the fuel rail, there's a few pressure sensors. Now I've dealt with lean coats on Volvos before and a few times it was the fuel pressure sensor reading wrong fuel pressure uh, leading to lean coats. So I wanted to measure the actual fuel pressure and compare it to the fuel pressure the sensor was reading. But as you can see, there's no test port on a fuel rail. So we actually had to measure in between a fuel line underneath the car and you can still see my pressure transducer hanging on the car. So we compared the actual fuel pressure to the fuel pressure the sensor was reading and it was actually spot on. So my colleague and I were thinking, we found an air leak, we fixed the air leak. Right now we're 100% positive the intake is no longer leaking air and the fuel pressure is all right. It's reading the right fuel pressure. The mass airflow sensor is new. The PCV valve has been replaced but still we're seeing very positive fuel trims. And then we remembered that the customer replaced the mass airflow sensor, but what if he ordered the wrong part number? So I asked my colleague to see what the mass airflow sensor reading was. And this is a three liter six cylinder engine, but right now it's idling and it's reading 2.8 grams per second. And that seems to be a little bit low to me on a three liter engine. So next we went into DDTSB and inside DDTSB there's a mass airflow calculator. So we entered the numbers and it quickly confirmed that the mass airflow should be a lot higher than just 2.8 grams per second. So why would a brand new mass airflow sensor read too low, especially when it's made by a respectable brand? Or at least on this sensor, I don't know if you can see that because the print is very faint, but it reads Hella and Hella is a very respectable manufacturer. So why would it read low? I mean, it could be that the customer ordered the wrong part number. So I asked my colleague to cross-reference this sensor, this Hella sensor, with the original Volvo part number. And he actually found out something very strange. The number does actually match, but it's missing one number. All Hella numbers are one number longer and this is missing one number it's one number short so we're actually thinking this is a fake hella sensor now i called the customer and asked him did you buy this sensor from a respectable reseller and i think you can guess it but his answer was well i bought it online which in most cases is a lot cheaper but also in most cases too good to be true so let's do a little test let's install the fake Hella sensor, and let's take a look at the fuel trims. So I've got the fake Hella Goodman installed right now, so let's take a look at the fuel trims. So I've got a short-term fuel trim of over 35% right now, and a long-term fuel trim of over 19%. So I've got a combined positive fuel trim of over 50%, indicating this engine is running very, very lean. So when I was on the phone with the customer and explained to him what we had found so far, he actually told me that he kept hold of the old original sensor and it was laying in his barn somewhere. So he told me that he would ask his wife to drop it by our shop and his wife was actually the hero of the day because trying to find a little part like this, which you have never heard of in your entire life in a big barn full of stuff must have been quite challenging, but she managed so let's install the old original sensor and let's take a look at the fuel trims. So I've got the original old mass airflow sensor installed right now. So let's take a look at the fuel trims. The short term fuel trim is about minus 10% right now. And the long term fuel trim is about 18%. So the total fuel trim is about 8% positive right now. So we went from 50% positive 
to 8% positive just by installing the old original mass airflow sensor. Now I think the rubber leaking seal we found was this car's original problem. Everything that happened after that was introduced by the customer himself by installing fake parts. Now the customer actually told me that in the beginning he had bad fuel trims but over time the fuel trims got worse and that makes me think worse in like after replacing the mass airflow sensor. Now when you see something online and it looks too good to be true, most of the time it is too good to be true. And the customer might have thought that this was a cheap part but actually every euro he has spent on it is one euro too many because all you can do with this is throw in the garbage because it is not going to fix your car. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe to my channel and when you hit the little bell, you will get a notification each time I upload a new video. And remember, diagnose then, fixed it again. See you next time guys. Now as you can see this Audi is stuck in quite a high position for your yeah. Now before we continue with diagnosing this Audi, I want to clickly clickly. Now before we continue diagnosing this Audi, I want to clickly clickly <sighs> So before I'm going to read fault codes, I'm quickly going to hook up a battery charge char char on the compressor. Now, when we're trying to lower the car by, by, by the rear, now I decided to, now I decided to replace the entire uh, compressor. Now I decided to complete, now I decided, damn it.